So thank you for uh, staying here. I mean, there's plenty of lunch, so please uh, keep having lunch as we have our next event. So as was mentioned earlier during the opening ceremony, um, this year was the first inaugural uh, Big East Undergraduate Research uh, Symposium. This was an event that um, encompassed all of the 11 Big East uh, universities and colleges, and each of the Big East schools uh, contributed um, five uh, teams. So it could have been an individual or a group of students. And um, so there were a total of, of 55 or 54, I think for some reason one of the schools didn't, didn't add one, but there were 54 presentations that were presented um, during, the, um, during the men's Big East uh, uh, basketball uh, championship game on, on Saturday, uh, March 13th, was it? Yeah, March 13th. Um, and, and the hope is that this event, of course, moves forward for uh, many years. So with a few reflections on, on the event, and uh, in particular, um, as was mentioned by our provost, um, this particular event was um, the birth child of the provosts of the various Big East universities. So with comments from our uh, provost office, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Passerini uh, had another prior engagement and could not be with us today, but she ha asked uh, Peter, um, uh, Dr. Peter Shoemaker, who is our uh, associate provost for um, undergraduate academics and assessment, <laughs> okay? Gets hard to remember all these different things. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Shoemaker. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lopez. This is, a, this is a great way to start a week, and I hope all of you will take the time to attend uh, other events uh, over the course of the week. You could set yourself a goal of maybe one event a day um, at a minimum. Uh, as uh, Dr. Lopez said, I'm here today representing Dr. Passerini, um, who would have liked to have been here, uh, but had to slip out for one of her uh, mini meetings, being a provost uh, is a demanding job, uh, which I wouldn't wish upon anyone except for those who seem to enjoy it. I'm going to make this relatively quick um, because I'm following Dr. Passerini, who was here um, earlier this afternoon and who spoke about uh, this program. And I have also had to follow Dr. Nair um, and uh, Dr. Chang and Dr. Lopez. So I, I sort of come at the end of a series of reflections. And, and, I'll, and I'll make it quick, but I, I do want to say um, something about the, the program uh, that we had uh, at Madison Square Garden on March 12th. And this is something that uh, I spoke about afterwards in some detail uh, with Dr. Passerini, and uh, we both were extraordinarily impressed uh, with the event. We were impressed with the organization of the event um, and the uh, energy and buzz that was around uh, the work and, um, if I can say it, the joy uh, of research. I want to acknowledge some of those who put together um, the fabulous celebration at Madison Square Garden uh, and are either here right now or um, at least here uh, in spirit. Uh, first of all, our Petersheim organizers, uh, Dr. Suli Chang and Dr. Jose Lopez, who represented Seton Hall in the planning of uh, the event. I'd like to give them a little round of applause. Uh, Dr. Don Apgar is here as well, um, and she contributed, and um, she also does, um, we were just talking about it, she does so many different things, uh, including for Peter Scheim. Uh, Don, are you out there? Yay. Uh, and Michael uh, Sante, who, who I uh, met for the first time uh, today, but whom I saw uh, at the, uh, um, the exposition uh, in New York, who is the uh, Senior Director of Compliance and Membership Services uh, for the Big East and uh, handled many, if not all, of the logistics of what was an extremely complicated event. So another round of applause. Uh, and then here you don't have to um, applaud right now. You wait until later and see how they do with their presentations. Uh, but the students themselves, um, who did a remarkable job with their presentations, 
and um, I could say a lot about them, but what I will say simply is that they were, they were interesting um, and, um, and thoughtful, which is uh, uh, very uh, strong praise. Um, I want to express uh, a few thoughts about how significant uh, this event was um, in uh, the history of the Petersheim uh, Exposition, because I think it represents a kind of watershed. Petersheim, as you know, it is, is special. Um, and um, it is a very strong tradition here at Seton Hall and represents a spirit of, of collaboration, a spirit of curiosity, um, a spirit of people coming together and doing research uh, in the service of the common good. And this event, I think, allowed um, the Petersheim exhibition to expand uh, its reach uh, and impact. And in that respect, I think it also provided an opportunity to showcase our students not just as knowledge consumers, uh, but as knowledge producers. This is going back to the notion that Dr. Nyer expressed of giving back to the body of knowledge. And that's something I think we do uh, extremely well at Seton Hall. And I think we may do better than some of our um, peers in the Big East, although um, I won't brag too much. So um, in conclusion, I want to congratulate our, and I, you know, we will applaud them, I think, uh, to congratulate our team of pirate research ambassadors um, I hope I have all their names. These are the names that were be being used in the email correspondence before the event. Elena, Lori, Matea, Cedra, Venise, uh, Ian, Charles, and Thomas. You guys did a great job, um, and you did us proud. Thank you. Oh, and I'll just say one last thing. This is going to be the fourth time uh, that they're going to be presenting this research in public because they presented it, obviously, at Peter Scheim last year. They presented it uh, to... Um, the group of, of the leadership group here um, for Peter Scheim, including Dr. Passerini, um, and uh, they presented it uh, at Madison Square Gardens. So this is this is number four. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shoemaker, for your. Um, Welcome from the Office of the Provost. Um, we will now proceed with our program. And I would like to introduce to everyone, um, he is uh, a member indirectly of our community. He is um, the um, Senior Director of Compliance and Membership Services for the Big East. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about uh, Michael Santi. And just let me say a few things about uh, Michael. I met him virtually, as I've met so many people over the last uh, two years. And um, Michael was given the very hard task of doing something that had never existed before, um, creating a, a completely new event. I mean, we all know about the Big East. It's been around for decades, and, and it's a sports um, a conference that organizes all of these different events. So we all know that the Big East, of course, are great organizers of sporting events. But this event that was organized was not a sporting event. This was an academic event. This was an event that was celebrating not athletic powerists, but was, uh, was celebrating academic, uh, scholarly, intellectual merit um, and, and, and scholarship that was being done at all of the different Big East schools. So he had the, I would say, difficult, very difficult task of, of, of inaugurating this new event known as the Big East Undergraduate Research uh, Symposium. And this event, of course, as was mentioned, was um, a poster event where each of the Big East schools, as I mentioned earlier, had to contribute their best scholars, their best student researchers, and they would compete against each other. And I hope my, uh, Michael will explain a little bit about, about that experience. Um, and as I met him, we also had, as, as was mentioned, um, there were uh, uh, faculty, administrators, staff from all, all the, of the other Big E schools. Um, um, Dr. Chang and I were, were voluntold um, by, by the provost to represent Seton Hall. And of course, we said yes. You always say yes when, when the big boss and our academic uh, boss t t tells you to do something. So we, of course, said yes, we will, we will represent Seton Hall. And to be honest, and Dr. Chang and I have talked about this for many times, it was a wonderful experience. We, we got to meet 
all of these other d different uh, folks who care so much about learning and education and research. And Mike in particular, I loved, he, sometimes he was at home and his, I could hear his kid in the background <laughs> and everything, but he's such a pro. He was able to, to put this very difficult to, to start a new event, but he, but he accomplished it. So without further ado, we'd like to have Michael, who's our guest today here, um, give, present to us and talk to us a little bit about. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How's it going? I obviously got the distinct honor of addressing the group after lunch, so hopefully I, I can keep some of your attention here. Uh, as Dr. Lopez uh, referenced earlier, my name is Michael Sante. Uh, I work for the Big East Conference, uh, and in my role, uh, some of what I do manages uh, policy and governance and rules and regulations for the Big East Conference, but the other half of my job is coming up with this collaborative programming uh, across our membership. Before I get started today, I just want to thank Dr. Chang and Dr. Lopez for the opportunity uh, to speak here today um, and the opportunity to work with you on our inaugural Big East Undergraduate Research Poster Symposium. And in this moment, I'm realizing we need to come up with an acronym for that because <laughs> that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you all and you know, hopefully today serves as a continuation of our relationship and not, and not my swan song. Um, to better explain how we got to this first ever symposium, I think it's important to take you all uh, on a brief history lesson, uh, just to kind of give you all some perspective and some context on how we arrived at this moment. <clears throat> In 2013, uh, a new version of the Big East was created. Uh, our basketball playing schools, affectionately known as the Catholic Seven, split from the football playing schools. Uh, and created this new version of the Big East, and we added three new schools uh, to give us a total of 10 member institutions. Those were Butler, uh, Creighton, DePaul University, Georgetown, Marquette, Providence, Seton Hall, St. John's, Villanova, and Xavier, uh, and as of 2019, UConn, uh, and I'm happy to say that I'm able to recite those schools in alphabetical order in my sleep these days, so. Um, but the emphasis on this new league was placed on basketball, right? Football kind of carried the day, uh, but uh, this, this group of institutions wanted to make sure that uh, we returned to our roots of basketball, uh, being a basketball-centric league. <clears throat> Following the creation of this new Big East, uh, our board of directors, which is made up of presidents of each of our institutions, uh, created a strategic plan uh, to help usher in the next five to 10 years uh, of, of the Big East Conference, this new version of the Big East Conference existence, right? So as you can imagine, on, on the top of this strategic plan was obviously solvency and sustainability of this new league. Uh, athletic excellence and academic excellence, right? These are the areas that the, these, uh, the board wanted us to focus on uh, in this new version uh, of, of the Big East. The academic pillar uh, was of, uh, of, of significance important, uh, part of our strategic plan. It was designed to transcend uh, and leverage the academic profile of our institutions to the benefit of Big East students generally, not just our student athletes, right? Uh, following this, uh, this strategic pillar, uh, we created the Academic Institutional uh, and Collaboration Working Group, which was charged with identifying and vetting uh, opportunities for collaboration amongst our membership. The working group is made up of athletic and academic uh, administrators, faculty, uh, as well as a member uh, of a provost uh, office or designee. Uh, and currently, the athletic director here at Seton Hall, Brian Felt, serves as the athletic director representative on this working group. To date, this working group has had the opportunity to engage and deliver programming uh, in a variety of spaces. We've worked with uh, admissions departments across our institutions to uh, recruit in communities that um, are underrepresented here on our institution's campuses. We've worked with our entrepreneurship uh, faculty and programs here to deliver uh, the Big East Startup Challenge, which Provost Passerini mentioned earlier, uh, where our students come in and pitch their um, ideas and concepts to a panel of venture capitalists, uh, and the opportunity to engage with the provost group, right, where who kind of serves as the brainchild for this concept of this undergraduate uh, research symposium. Our provost recognized the importance of uh, creating a premier academic event to partner with our premier athletic event um, at the Madison Square Garden and provide uh, the Big East an opportunity to showcase its athletic and academic prowess at the highest levels uh, in the world's most famous arena, Madison Square Garden. 
who also has a rich history of excellence associated with that, except for the Knicks. And obviously, that's coming from, coming from a Knicks fan. Um, originally, we planned to roll out this event in 2021 at our men's basketball tournament, but as you can imagine, the uh, pandemic uh, kind of ruined those plans and disrupted just about every opportunity for us to get together in person. Right, so uh, our, our 2021 men's basketball tournament actually served as the first in, in the event's 42 year history to take place without any fans in the building. So that was, uh, as you can imagine, the demand for uh, the 2022 tournament was pretty high. Uh, once we realized, or once it was somewhat clear that we were going to have uh, fans and spectators at our 2022 event, uh, we began to uh, start the planning process for uh, this inaugural event event in earnest. Uh, we convened a small planning group of which Dr. Lopez and Dr. Chang were uh, participants of uh, to help provide the conference with some technical direction about how to deliver an event like this, right? As Dr. Lopez mentioned, we're used to hosting wide-scale athletic events um, and understand how to put together an event, but there are some technical things that go into producing an event or a symposium where students are able to present uh, their research. The conference provided operational marketing and, and communication support to this event by way of our, our website and our press releases and our social media handles that have a wide ranging reach. Um, and we also worked with the garden to make sure that we provided the best experience possible for all of the attendees of this event. The symposium uh, took place the morning of our championship game and lasted about three hours. Uh, each institution was tasked with selecting their representatives with a maximum of five projects per institution, not more than two students representing uh, each of those projects. This led to over 125 students, faculty and staff representing all 11 of our Big East institutions uh, participating in this uh, uh, event with over 50 unique research projects ranging from physical and natural sciences to literature and social justice uh, issues. Uh, folks uh, or participants had the uh, opportunity to descend on New York City uh, for two days to uh, pr participate in uh, networking, uh, present their research, eat some good food, uh, and have an opportunity to attend uh, our men's basketball championship game. Students presented their research to faculty and administrators from uh, each of our institutions. No judge observed any students from their uh, institution to maintain integrity of the judging process. And the event also included an opening and closing program that was attended by uh, our commissioner, Val Ackerman, uh, as well as lunch. Each project was judged on its visual quality and content, its research and discussion, presentation style, and the overall knowledge of the presenters, uh, research, overall knowledge of the presenters of their research uh, and their research's outcome, their research outcomes. The top three projects received a medal uh, and acknowledgement uh, for their achievements. Following these presentations, uh, the teams had the opportunity to attend the men's championship game where we recognized them uh, in front of a raucous crowd of 18,000 Big East basketball fans. To date, the feedback has been great for this event. Our students, faculty, and administrators uh, had a wonderful experience at this inaugural event, and our provosts have been supportive of continuing this event and the importance of it being tethered to our biggest event of the year, our men's basketball tournament. Our small planning group has, has uh, plans to reconvene and find ways to improve this event moving forward, uh, and my guess is that this event will be uh, lasting for years to come. Events like this mean so much to the conference as it aligns with our vision and mission to use athletic, athletics as a platform for national exposure and as a vehicle for uh, you all to engage with students, alumni, faculty, and staff. We hope this can serve as an inspiration for you to share, honor, and unite, and while continuing to shed light on issues affecting our world. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to speaking with you a bit more about our program. Thank you, Michael, for your wonderful introduction to how this event came about. And um, we'd like to now spend a little bit of time and um, present our, our team, our, our, uh, our Big East uh, Seton Hall University uh, research uh, team. Um, so in order to do that, 
um, we're going to, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Don Apgar, who is an assistant professor of social work in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice. Yes, it's the, the has the longest name of any department in the university. And she will host the students, providing a synopsis um, of, of their work that they've done. So Don. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so welcome everyone. I think I actually, all my students are here. So uh, so welcome everyone uh, to our Big East uh, Poster Symposium. What we thought we would do is uh, we would ask each of uh, the presenters to come up. Are you more nervous uh, here or at the Big East? Here? Oh, okay. Uh, so we thought what we would do is uh, broadcast their posters, give them an opportunity to just talk for a couple of minutes about uh, their work, and I think even more importantly, to talk about what it was like to be a presenter at the Big East. Uh, I know my students have done electronic posters, which they weren't too thrilled about making those video recordings, right? Um, and we are doing, uh, in social work, we're doing a uh, symposium of electronic posters. I think this is really the first time that students have the opportunity to see what a, a real life uh, poster session looks like. So here you'll see some pictures of how the students got prepared. They came uh, to campus the night before. We had a little run through of their presentations. Uh, you'll see them actually presenting their work. Uh, with the judges and there were other faculty there. They stood next to their poster and had the opportunity to talk a little bit about their research and uh, answer questions. So they're gonna talk about what that experience was like as well as give you sort of an overview of uh, each of the projects. So Thomas, do you wanna come, uh, is Thomas there? Oh, they're there. If you wanna come first, we have your poster and if you could talk a little bit about your project, that would be great. And then we have certificates, because everyone is a winner. Everyone is a winner. Let me see how I can. Uh... I think it's better if we download this and then open it. Is, if that's OK. Can I try to open it in the PDF reader? There we go. All right, so uh, as you can see here, I, um, I presented the project, the synthesis and characterization of uh, biodiesel using microalgae as a sedimental triglyceride source. So just as like a quick background, um, you can make biodiesel um, from basically like any oil source, and a lot of people are doing it from vegetable oil sources, um, but it's really interesting to look into alternatives to that because, as everybody knows, our population keeps growing and our energy demands keep rising. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are we going to use this available plot of land to grow food or to grow crops for fuel? Well, with the algae, we don't have that problem. They can grow in places where our food um, can grow, our food crops. Um, so why is biodiesel so interesting? Well, the combination of all those problems like the threat of the fossil fuel depletion or global warming, pollution, uh, or rising energy demands, we're not saying that this is going to solve all the problems, but we're saying that it's one of the solutions to all of these problems. And 
it's so important that more and more people are doing research into this so that we can optimize the process so that we can help make that global transition to renewable and environment friendly energy sources. In other words, it has to become more economically favorable um, before we can actually start making a change. As you can see over here, we kind of represent an, um, an alternative biodiesel cycle with the algae as um, oil source. And then after they grow, we extract the oil, we perform a transfication reaction where we actually turn it into the biodiesel fuel. Um, and then from the fuel consumption, from burning that, um, we exhaust carbon dioxide into the air, which will be taken up again by the algae because they need carbon dioxide to grow. Um, and then one of the most interesting oil extraction methods that we've been looking into now is the um, glycerol, uh, using, uh, using glycerol in a polyol induced extraction and interesting about that is that the side product of your transfiguration is uh, glycerol as well. So that means that you can use that again in your extraction, mix, which makes it even more sustainable. And that is based on the work from another Seton Hall uh, student a while ago. So yeah, are there any questions or, yeah? Um, the experience, yeah, for me it was the first time presenting in person because last year Peter Sham was online. Um, it was amazing. It was in Madison Square Garden. Like, yeah, it was it was very impressive. I was definitely stressed out before it, but when when we were there with the team from Seton Hall, everybody was kind of like in the same position. First time we're doing this, kind of like just had to. Um, yeah, take everything in and, and realize that it's a great opportunity and that kind of took the stress away from me. Um, it was kind of fun to do. And once I realized that, stress was went away. I'm very grateful for everybody that made it possible, that organized it. Um, and yeah, I, I'm excited for more students to be able, be able to have this experience in the future. And I feel very fortunate that I was uh, amongst the first ones. So that's good right there. Presentation mode. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Zarusin. Oh, thank you. Yay. And <laughs> I'm a senior at Seton Hall University. And my poster is Galvanizing Democracy, Combating Social Isolation, and Increasing Accessibility for People with Disabilities. People with disabilities face many barriers that increase their social isolation. Things like communication difficulties, uh, mobility and access challenges, poverty, and as well as stigma and social exclusion. Social isolation leads to political isolation because people with disabilities cannot easily participate in the political process. You know, joining things like marches or protests, community activism, running for pol political office, we know one in four American adults has a disability, yet only 10% of our elected officials are disabled. Also with voting, people with disabilities are 6% less likely to vote than someone without a disability. In 2020 election, 61.8% of people with disabilities voted, which was an increase of 1.7 million from 2016. And that was due primarily to COVID-19 and increased mail-in balloting. Yet, still, 6% of people with disabilities were less likely to vote than someone without a disability. And why is that? What we're finding is people with disabilities are still reporting obstacles to voting. While we have laws like the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the American with Disabilities Act, these laws are not fully protecting people with disabilities. 
And while we should have been celebrating the fact that more Americans than ever voted in 2020, we now have state legislatures who are trying to make it more difficult to vote, which negatively impacts people, marginalized people, and vulnerable populations. And they're doing that because of, fraudulent, of erroneous claims of voter fraud, uh, which is not substantiated. And some of these barriers that they're creating are the voter ID requirements. People with disabilities don't necessarily have a driver's license. Eliminating or reducing early voting, prohibiting on-site aid for people at the polls, paper-only ballots, and unfortunately, many polling places are in religious organizations, and they are exempt from the American with Disabilities Act. So we need to create some interventions to uphold and so we can achieve the Americans with Disabilities Act's four pillars, which is, oh my gosh, it's really <laughs> small and I'm older. <laughs> Full participation, equal opportunity, uh, gosh, uh, independent living and economic self-sufficiency. Luckily, I have a loud voice. Uh, <laughs> and the thing that's really exciting about this problem is that 61 million American adults have a disability. And when you add their friends and their family, this becomes a very powerful lobby that is up to date, untapped. People with disabilities cross a, a cut across political divides. And while there are some groups that have a more prevalence for disability, every, every socioeconomic group has disability within it. And what a lot of politicians should be considering is the fact that voters with disabilities are not strongly associated with any one political party. So what we need to do is first combat social isolation. And some of my recommendations are increasing outreach through teletherapy or telephone reassurance, establishing a dedicated helpline for mental health, and strengthening community self-help and support groups. And then we can start to talk about the political isolation. And we need to make voter registration available to all, ensuring accessible polling places, establishing procedures that do not discriminate, as well as providing accessible voting systems with voice capability. But most importantly is we need to create a mentoring program that proactively encourages people with disabilities to get involved in the political process. Because who better to create laws for people living with disability than someone who is living with a disability? Thank you. Thank you. And actually, I want to go into why was Big East so fabulous? I don't believe you that it was the inaugural one because it ran so smoothly. I was so impressed. It was a fabulous, from start to finish, experience. And it's really easy to get discouraged when you turn on the news and think like this is kind of a hopeless situation we're in. And I walked into that, I had no idea what I was doing. I've never done, spoken, I was scared out of my mind. I, I was praying for a power grid failure. <laughs> and it ended up being the most fabulous experience of my life. I grew in confidence and I also got really hopeful because there were some amazing students there talking about solutions to problems that I was like, then we'll never fix that problem. And then I read their poster and it's like, we can, and it's not that hard. It's not that hard. And getting diverse groups of people, whether, you know, like Thomas is chemistry, the nursing, biology, I can't, social work. We all need to get in the room together and find solutions. And that is what you guys did that day. And I just can't thank you enough for the opportunity. And I know that it, going forward, it's just going to be continue to be as fabulous. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, before your own cheering section, <laughs> could you? I think one thing would be uh, you shared with me a story about how at the Big East, uh, several of your experiences sort of came together. You had been at the Yukon the week before and you right. talked, could you just share in a second about that experience that you had when you sure. were presenting your poster? So the weekend before, I had gone with Marky, Emily, and Chelsea to the campaign school for social work. And that was a really exciting event as well. 
And so the provost for UConn came, was one of my judges, and we talked about how fabulous that ca the campaign school had been, and he actually said, well, where are you going to grad school? And I'm like, well, I already know I'm going to grad school. He's like, well, he, I want you to call me if you ever want to come to UConn. So it was a great way to network. Thanks and, so much. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Lori? No? OK. No. Uh, we're now going to have Matea and Cedra present. Um, hello everyone, my name is Cedra, um, and I'm a biology major at the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, my partner, Matea, unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, today I will be presenting a project that talks about the impact of COVID-19 on Alzheimer's disease through the protein uh, called amyloid precursor protein, which is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease pathology. This is a meta-analysis that was conducted with a software called IPA. Um, IPA is a bioinformatics tool um, with an extensive repository of um, genes that model different diseases, gene expressions, metabolism, just to name a few. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown that followed forced us to step down, um, some, I'm sorry, to step away from the lab, and IPA was useful in providing us um, with a um, way to conduct research outside of the lab. Um, as we probably all know by now, COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which impacts the respiratory system of the body. Um, the mechanism by which the COVID-19 infection takes place is through a receptor called the ACE2 receptor. Um, and the mechanism can be seen over here at the top. Um, Upon infection, the ACE2 receptor internalizes the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, and then once it's inside the cell, it uses the machinery of the cell to replicate and spread to the surrounding cells. Um, using IPA, we were able to find the upstream regulators of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this can be seen in this image over here. Um, on your left are the upstream regulators of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this was also done to ACE2 and the amyloid precursor protein of Alzheimer's disease. We found the intermediate molecules, and then using a tool of IPA, we were able to simulate the activation of the upstream regulators of SARS-CoV-2. We were able to find that the ACE2 receptor was downregulated, and then upon that inhibition, um, the, AP, the APP protein was upregulated. We also added a quantitative component using the Kramer analysis um, to calculate z-scores for each individual relationship, um, which showed us that our results were statistically significant. Um, we hypothesized that the APP expression increases as a result of the COVID-19-induced cytokine storm, um, which causes widespread inflammation in the body and in the brain specifically. Um, in conclusion, our research found that COVID-19 may play a casual role in the onset or exacerbation of Alzheimer's disease through increasing the expression of amyloid precursor protein. Our next step would be to take it up a notch um, and use in vitro and in vivo studies to further investigate the impact of COVID-19. Um, thank you to Dr. Chang, Dr. Lopez, um, Dr. Passerini and everyone that was involved in giving us the ability to um, go to the Big East Conference. I think I speak for myself and everyone involved that it was an incredible opportunity and we're very grateful for it. Um, I got to step out of my comfort zone um, and take part in a conference that's not behind a screen or virtual. Um, and I grew a lot, so thank you. Are there any questions for Cedra? 
Do you, uh, Cedra, before you, yes. could you talk a little bit, you had a co-presenter, so could you talk a little bit about doing collaborative research just in, you know, in a minute or so, like how was it to present with someone else or to coordinate uh, with another, uh, what were some of the challenges? Um, I think it was a lot easier to be able to present with somebody. Um, we were able to bounce ideas off of each other and she explained the parts that she researched um, and was more confident in. Um, just the same that I did, uh, which, and I think it was really helpful um, to see that I wasn't the only one that was nervous or scared, um, and her continuous support was very helpful. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now we're gonna have Venice Matthew, right? Um, hi everyone, I'm Venice and this is Ian, my partner, and we're going to share um, a little bit about our research. So we worked on improving photovoltaic conversion efficiency of CDS, CDTE based thin film solar cells. So as we all know that um, the world is currently running on exhaustible gases such as fossil fuels, so one alternative way we can um, work that the global crisis, energy crisis is through photovoltaics or converting sunlight into um, electricity. And specifically in this research, we're, we're focusing more on thin film technology, which is CDTE, which is currently at 15% to 25% in photovoltaic conversion efficiency. And we were able to do this research um, using simulations theoretically and also experimentally through um, post laser deposition. So Ian will talk more about the results and our conclusions. Thank you, Denise. Howdy, everyone. Um, my predominant area of research here was done virtually, mostly in my pajamas. Um, I worked on simulations with Wexamps, which was a given simulation software that allowed us to simulate the various electrical and optical properties of thin films using any combination of thickness values and given parameters per, uh, per, per compound. Um, I simulated it and then doing these simulations we were able to tell the given efficiency values and of course naturally these efficiency values were dependent upon the thickness values or upon the parameters that were inputted per compound. Um, we had very surprising results, uh, spe spe specifically if I can zoom in here. Uh, we had very, very surprising results uh, when we used um, the, um, when we were using something known as ITO, CDS, and CDTE thin film. Um, predominantly, we were able to get um, uh, a, a very, very high efficiency value of 22.05% when we inputted another compound known as zinc telluride into this thin film. Um, we did this by putting, and putting in this compound, changing the thickness values that varied over time, which allowed us to find a very, very high efficiency value of 22.05%. This is big because we want an efficiency value around 15 to 25%. So you can imagine 22% is actually quite awesome, suffice to say the least. Um, so this uh, allowed, this was the predominant area of our research of the uh, Big East Research Symposium. And I could say on behalf of myself, it was an amazing experience. I had an excellent time being able to present literally the first time my research in general. Venice can probably talk a little bit more about her experience. Personally, I find it really helpful as a researcher, like going into a in-person symposium or conference, it was more of the learning process as a growing researcher and knowing more about the other, other researchers' studies. And yeah, it was fun and awesome. So thank you so much for everyone who put up with this event. 
Any questions for Ian or Venice? I have a, oh wait, where are you? I have a question. Uh, so how, could you comment, there were a lot of um, posters with very technical, scientific findings, and your judges, were they, were they well-versed in, they were, they were well-versed. So you oh, didn't yeah. have to explain some of these uh, intricate scientific concepts to them? Were they all uh, science professors or? I think all of those were science okay. professors. We had a chemistry. We had okay. a we had a we had a math. Uh, <laughs> that guy uh, was awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I think uh, I think we had another person. I, I couldn't tell what it is. I think it was engineering. Um, but yeah, we There's we have people who are very well versed. We had people who didn't. Of course, we have obviously had to explain the work to them. But they knew exactly what we were talking about. They were able to follow along. They were like, all right, what were you talking about the okay. entire time? They were listening. They were providing suggestions, especially the math professor. And um, we had, and we, it was a very good experience being able to present to someone, uh, to people who were obviously very scientific. Great, thanks. I think we're gonna ask all of our uh, student presenters to come up and we'll put the, um, the original and then we'll do a certificate, right? We'll have Dr. Lopez, uh, Dr. Shane, we'll have everyone come together and, and Michael. Okay, thank you for everyone for, for participating. In particular, I, I, we'd like to thank um, the sponsors of this event. Um, in particular, we'd like to thank, of course, the Office of the Provost that provides the um, funding for the entire expo. Um, and of course, all, all of the different um, f uh, deans and schools that also uh, fund the specific events that are going on at each of the colleges and schools at Seton Hall. But in particular, we'd like to thank for this event um, the Institute for Immuno, uh, Neuroimmunopharmacology that uh, the, Dr. Chang is the director of. We'd like to thank you, Dr. Chang, for, for, for appropriating some funds to uh, host this event. Dr. Chang, of course, has been, uh, since the very beginning, uh, an extremely, not only 
there are people who are vocal supporters and emotional supporters, but she's been everything, physical, emotional, everything, an extremely, extremely important uh, individual and force here at the university in promoting scholarship and research. So thank you, Dr. Chang, for all you do, really, thank you. We'd like to thank, once again, all our presenters. These are the best of the best that Seton Hall had to, uh, to, had to offer, and they did excellent, as you all saw and witnessed today at the Big East event. We're looking forward, where we're challenging Michael Sante and the Big East team to, to continue this wonderful event, as we saw, nothing but good feedback. Uh, you've been getting, and uh, we look forward to next year's event at Madison Square Garden, and um, we're thinking of also doing a similar event next year to uh, thank our team uh, that will participate next year. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please go to the different events that are going on throughout the week, and, um, and onward and forward. Go Pirates!